Case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It's a preventable mistake that rocks our city time and time again. We're talking about drunk driving. And as we get ready to enjoy those New Year's Eve celebrations, Jeffany Gray speaks with a mother who lost her daughter because of a suspected drunk driver. And she's hoping that her loss encourages others to think twice before they get behind the wheel after a few drinks. Every time I walk to my car, I pray for them and I pray for their family. Michelle Taylor is one of thousands of mothers impacted by the painful result of drunk driving. She says it's like ripping a Band-Aid off every time she sees another mother added to the list of fallen children. The most recent mother added to that list, a woman whose newborn baby was killed after San Antonio police say Gerardo Lozano drove through a red light on the west side Christmas Eve. The pain never goes away and so what she's going through right now is hell. It's been four and a half months since Taylor lost her daughter, 25-year-old registered nurse Daniela Lute, in a fiery wrong way crash. I would have never in my life thought that it will happen to my baby. Lute died with her friend, 26-year-old Diana Rubio, after a suspected drunk driver crashed head on into them. Now, Taylor says she lives to raise awareness about drunk driving and to remind others, people like her daughter, are not just statistics. They have faces, they have names, they have impacted so many people in a positive way. Taylor drives her car covered with images of victims of drug driving through Houston traffic to show what could happen if you make the conscious effort to drink and drive. To put a drink to your lips, to start the car and start driving. It is not an accident. I just want you to close your eyes and think about who do you love the most and if they are gone because of this preventable act, how would you feel? And as New Year's Eve celebrations kick off, Taylor wants the loss of her daughter to remind others to use rideshare options. I will make her proud until I see her again. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Now, meanwhile, San Antonio police are investigating a deadly suspected drunk driving crash. It happened around 1.30 in the morning in the 1200 block of Southwest Loop 410 on the city's far west side. SAPD says the driver of a 2004 Mustang had left a party and was speeding when he hit a puddle in the road. Somehow he lost control, hit a utility pole, a tree, a fire hydrant, and then some metal railing. The driver wasn't wearing a seatbelt died at the scene. The passenger in his car did have his or her seatbelt on and just suffered minor injuries. And now investigators are looking into whether alcohol played a role in that accident. So if you're able to go out and celebrate the new year, there are a few things that you can do to get home safely. Of course, you can use a ride sharing app like Uber or Lyft, call a cab, call someone you trust who's sober, or make sure you have a designated driver in your group. We just want you to be safe. In other news, police arrested a man for allegedly pointing a gun on his wife and kicking a child in the face. That was on Christmas Day. An arrest affidavit states that 29-year-old Sal Vaquera tried kicking a one-year-old's crib, but instead struck the baby in the face. And when his wife tried to calm the child down, authorities say that Vaquera hit, the, hit his wife in the face, pointed a gun at her, and then threatened to kill her. Now, police say the wife did manage to get out safely, and now Vaquera is charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. We're only a few hours away from 2022, and tonight's big New Year's uh, downtown celebration. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says that the party's still on, Omicron or not, since 8 out of 10 people in San Antonio are vaccinated and they know about masks and social distancing. Officials say that we do have the tools to safely welcome in the new year. We are uh, confident that people have used the tools and that we have a, a, an outdoor event where the precautions are being observed. We can be safe about a New Year's celebration. So tonight's celebration came up during a morning briefing by city, county and hospital leaders about the winter surge of COVID-19 cases fueled by this Omicron variant that we've been talking about. Now, officials say that both the city and county are working to get more of those rapid tests, but they do say, however, we do have plenty of PCR tests. They're being distributed at the free testing sites around town. The demand for tests has even overwhelmed the emergency department at University Health. They say that local hospitals also have seen a nearly 78% increase in cases because of Omicron. So what they're telling people to do is not to go to the ER to get tested. Help us ensure that we have the sufficient capacity 
and more healthy staff members to care for those in need, whether it be for COVID or other serious medical conditions. So they say that if more people do what they need to do to protect themselves and others, then 2022 will hopefully be a better year than the last two. Problem is, though, across the U.S., pediatric hospital admissions are hitting new records. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association, almost 400 children are being admitted to hospitals for COVID every day. New studies released by the CDC show the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines in children. And one of those studies is finding that only 1% of children ages 5 to 17 who actually wind up in the hospital are fully vaccinated. Children, even though they tend to have a more mild case from coronavirus, they can still absolutely get a severe illness, get hospitalized or worse. But there is some good news here. Deaths in the U.S. are down around 11 percent in the last week. And leaders in South Africa are saying that the country got over its peak without a huge spike in deaths. And we all know that the South Africa saw uh, how they were affected with the Omicron variant before we did. Now happening now, Celebrate SA just got underway a few minutes ago and a lot of people are planning to go there for tonight's celebration. Our John Paul Barajas is live downtown. John Paul, I see a lot more people out there behind you right now. What are people mostly excited about? Stephanie, uh, you said it yourself. Uh, a lot more people out here already at Celebrate SA's New Year's Eve event than just an hour ago. And everybody's excited because last year this event was canceled. So after a one-year hiatus, everything's back in full swing. People are ready to celebrate. The drinks are already pouring. And also because the drinks are pouring, drinking and driving is always an issue, more so on New Year's Eve, which is why Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says you have to plan ahead, which is what one couple we spoke to says they've already done. Oh, we're walking. Yeah. Walking, we're walking. walking. Do you all have a hotel <laughs> around the area? or? Yeah, we do. We're staying like near, right near the river walk. Don't drink and drive. <laughs> yeah, not worth it. And again, plan ahead before stepping out the door. Unfortunately, because of the Omicron variant being so infectious, uh, AAA Texas has said tipsy towing this year will not be available. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Of Uber, Lyft, and all that other stuff. All right. So as if doctors and parents don't have enough to worry about, now there's a new disease that most of us haven't even seen before. It's actually so rare that often it goes undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and mismanaged. Ursula Perry has more on how researchers are working to find innovative ways to treat children with this disease. Watch. Evan Brandon taught himself how to play the mandolin when rare disease forced him to take a break from his strenuous studies at Princeton. I was basically in and out of the hospital every few weeks. Evan spent most of his high school years battling infections. I, I had a lot of GI issues. He is just one of six boys who have been diagnosed with a mutation in the gene known as TLR8 that plays a fundamental role in activating the immune system. That They have inflammatory response turned on inappropriately. Most patients suffer a low count of neutrophils, white blood cells that patrol the immune system and act as first responders by destroying foreign invaders. Their body is basically turning on without a trigger. And this high inflammatory response that they have leads to um, lowering of their immune cells. Pediatric immunologist Megan Cooper collaborated with 30 scientists from all over the world and gathered tissue samples from patients' lungs, skin, and blood. I think the biggest mystery is what is triggering it. Evan got a bone marrow transplant to replenish the white blood cells. He believes that cured him. And he asked if he could have the naming rights for the disease. It's infiltrate spelled infltr8 which it stands for inflammation neutropenia bone marrow failure lymphoproliferation caused by tlr8 and he's the one who came up with infiltrate which is a great name and that's what we're calling it since this study two more patients have been diagnosed with infiltrate they're both boys but researchers believe that girls could possibly be affected as well there's a need for more research on this more testing more awareness ursula perry case at 12 news all right, taking a live look outside right now. It looks so nice, but you know it's going to look super nice downtown today because of all those New Year's 
party celebration. 79 degrees right now. I can't believe we're saying that. December 31st. Oh, man, I remember New Year's Eve's past where we were bundled up outside and we had hats and gloves on. It was so cold. Complete opposite. Unseasonably warm conditions and a record high temperature today. I do want to point out the aquifer down a little bit. Uh, we're almost five feet below average for this time of year. But mountain cedar is up there again today. Mountain cedar is in the very high category and you notice it. So outdoors, keep in mind, we're really in the thick of cedar season and it's not going to get any better this weekend with the north wind. Warm and humid tonight. Tomorrow, New Year's Day, sunny and in the 80s. But by Sunday morning, our first freeze likely. A huge temperature drop by 50 degrees within about 12 hours. We're going to talk more about this and what you can expect from that pending cold front coming up. This SA Salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by Bob Mills Furniture. To all the San Antonio military families, I'm Bob Mills wishing you a Merry Christmas and thank you for your service. So we know that living in South Texas comes with that South Texas heat. So, you know, air conditioning, yeah, an essential here. And a local business is well known for making that a reality. It's all part of our series, Untold History Untold, and that is tonight on The Night Beat. From COVID-19 vaccines first being administered to the February freeze in Texas to Fiesta making a return to UTSA's historic season. A lot has happened in 2021, and as we leave the year, here's a look back at what we've been through over the last 12 months. We the people! Procedure and decorum in Congress shatter today when a peaceful protest turned into a siege. Let's have trial by combat. We're gonna walk down to the Capitol. This way! The Capitol went into lockdown with members of Congress inside. A Universal City man facing charges in connection with the breach at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. 52-year-old Stephen Capuccio. Good morning, everyone. It's a winter wonderland out there. It's just a beautiful sight to see. The unprecedented winter weather. Our city transformed into white. CPS Energy says it's under orders to begin rotating outages. What happened this week to our fellow Texans is absolutely unacceptable. Acceptable. The White House facing a surge in undocumented teens crossing the border. Federal officials today announcing the opening of a second emergency shelter for unaccompanied migrant children right here in San Antonio. An active shooter killed at the airport after San Antonio police say he was firing shots at random, aiming at an officer and at one of the terminals. People as young as 16 are eligible for the vaccines. The city of San Antonio began offering them this morning with no reservations needed. People say it's great to see life getting back to normal. Chicken on a stick! We are going to party tonight! He emerged from the home holding two large handguns, firing at us and an SUV with his own family inside. By my count, six times as we scattered in different directions. Shots fired 200 block Noria Street. I'm with News Media KSAT 12. We really saw no emotion for McCain for much of this trial. Oh, this is a live picture right there. You see McCain with an elbow to the bailiff. Making headlines this morning, 17 area school districts headed back to classroom today. Woo! New school and a new level of excitement as SEISD teachers and students fully return back to the classroom in person. A humanitarian emergency. Sky 12 capturing these images. More than 12,000 migrants crowded under the Del Rio International Bridge. High water has led to heartbreak in East Bear County. Two people believed to have died after being swept away by rushing water today. Embattled president and CEO Paula Gold Williams will resign next year. We are learning more information when it comes to the deadly drought racing event in Kerrville. The two people killed were children. Eight others were also injured. Came up across the crowd, hit the kids, hit the other people that were there. And our city has really been celebrating Dia de los Muertos all week long. The CDC's director now endorsing the recommendation for children 5 through 11 to get the vaccine. There is no reason to wait. Dr. Lumali Apache says the vaccine is safe. Are you excited? Can you feel it? We all right there with head coach Jeff Trailer as he gets his Gatorade back.
half tonight in the Alamodome. The UTSA Roadrunners are Conference USA champions for the first time. Yeah, I got to say, I got chills watching that, right? Because there's so much hope, and that's what New Year's celebrations are really all about. We want this year, next year to be fabulous. And here's a live look right now, downtown, where Celebrate SA is uh, happening, 78 degrees right now. You see a few people there walking around, but you know how San Antonio does. I mean, the party's just getting started. Oh, yeah, this is the city that likes to party. We have a good time, and it's going to be a good time tonight. Weather's not going to get in the way. There have been... New Year's Eve's in the past where it was windy and it was cold and it was a different story. This is unseasonably warm and our high temperature 83 degrees. That's 20 degrees above average and tied the record high for the day, which was set back in 1915. And you look at other temperatures, Pleasanton 89. Catula, 92 the high temperature. New Braunfels and Gonzales both, both made it to 85 for their high temperatures. Now, watch what's going to happen to our morning readings. They'll be in the mid 60s tomorrow morning, right? More of the same. But then by Sunday, we're down to freezing. Monday morning, we're at 25 degrees. So get ready for our first official freeze Sunday morning and then a hard freeze for many of us Monday morning. Let's get right to it with temperatures. Currently 80 south of Highway 90 and elsewhere, we're generally in the 70s. 71 Kerrville, Uvalde 78, New Braunfels at 79. And across the state, we do see temperatures drop off a bit up into the panhandle where we're in the 50s. Lubbock, Amarillo, 53, 54. But the real cold front, that's moving through southern Kansas right now, about to hit Oklahoma. Ahead of this front, you see the warmer temperatures anywhere from the 50s to the 70s. Behind it, temperatures quickly drop down into the 20s and even below zero as you get up toward the Canadian border. That cold front, it's not going to make it here until tomorrow night by about 11 p.m. So let's talk about temperatures and go through time here. Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., west of I-35, close to 60 degrees. Along and east of I-35, well into the 60s, so unseasonably warm. Actually, our morning low will be 3 degrees warmer than the average afternoon high. That puts it in perspective. And then by tomorrow afternoon, looks like another record-challenging day. The record high is 83. That's what we're expecting for the high temperature. Pleasanton 88 again, Carrizo Springs 89, Uvalde 85. The big change happens between 5 p.m. Saturday and 5 a.m. Sunday. That 12 hour period should feature a 50, 50 degree temperature drop, going from 83 degrees at 5 p.m. Saturday down to about 32 degrees by 5 a.m. Sunday. So about a 50 degree temperature drop in roughly 12 hours or so. So we're talking shorts and short sleeves Saturday afternoon and then jackets and bundling up as we get into Sunday morning when we'll likely have our first freeze. And then temperatures, they rebound a little bit as we get into next week briefly, 60s and 70s by Tuesday and Wednesday. Then another strong cold front comes. So let's get right to it here with our dew points. They're in the 60s. We're feeling the mugginess. It's going to lead to some areas of fog after midnight tonight and first thing tomorrow morning. But the dry line moves through around 11 a.m. tomorrow. So by the noon hour, the humidity is going to quickly plunge tomorrow. So when you'll wake up, it'll be sticky. But by the midday, by noon, Humidity swept away and then the cold front hits and plunges even drier air into place. We're talking dew points in the single digit Sunday morning. So if you're susceptible to dry skin or chapped lips, get ready for it Sunday and even on into early next week. Also, the wind's going to get gusty. It's going to be a pretty breezy weekend, especially Saturday night into Sunday. We're talking wind gusts up to about 40, 45 miles per hour out of the north. Latest pollen count today, Mountain Cedar. Count of nearly 25,000. I believe that's the highest count in two years now. I don't think it's going to get any better with that north wind that's coming on a Saturday night and into Sunday. That's the cedar breeze coming out of the hill country. All right, in terms of rainfall, it's all in West Texas and off to our north in North Texas and Oklahoma. I wish we could tap into some of that much needed moisture out there. Upper level disturbance is going to push that moisture up and away from us. So uh, no rainfall with this front or the next front. 83 tomorrow afternoon, 32 Sunday morning. Huge temperature drop, sunny and cold on Saturday, gusty as well. Uh, Monday, 25 in the morning, by the afternoon, 55 and sunny. The next cold front hits Thursday, giving us a similar temperature drop. Okay, Adam, thank you. Now, one thing that we are looking forward to is that everything looks good in Cowboys world. Uh, that's right. Things are looking better. At least they're one of the few teams in the NFL that hasn't had any COVID issues this week. It seems like everyone's getting COVID at the wrong time of year, but 
Dallas is on the upswing and they have a chance to play for the one seed. When we come back, we'll talk about what looks to be a huge weekend for Dallas. Plus, it's been a tough year for Texans head coach David Culley. How does he look back on 2021? Next. Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond is heading back to the WNBA. Sham Sharina of The Athletic first reported late last night that the six-time All-Star is set to agree to a five-year deal to become the head coach and general manager of the Las Vegas Aces. Hammond has always considered the possibility of returning to the WNBA. In multiple prior interviews, she said it would be an honor to do so. But over the summer, she made history as the first female finalist for an NBA head coaching gig. The Portland Trailblazers ultimately selected Chauncey Billups to lead their squad this season. It has felt inevitable at times that Hammond would be the one to break through and lead an NBA team. So now that she's heading to Vegas, would Derek White be surprised if Hammond winds up in the NBA again in the future? No, nah, no, nah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, I mean, she understands the game, knows the game. Um, everybody loves and respects her, so um, I would not be surprised to see her and get an NBA job as well. Hammond will remain with the Spurs for the remainder of the season. San Antonio kicks off a long seven-game road trip tonight in Memphis. Tip is scheduled for 7 p.m. We'll have highlights tonight on the Night Beat. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. It is a big week for the Cowboys, who are still in the hunt for the NFC's top seed. A win plus a Packers loss means the NFC's road to the Super Bowl would likely go through Dallas. But before that, the Cowboys need to take care of the Cardinals at home on Sunday, and there's good news on that front. While Dallas has won four straight games, capped off by a thorough domination of Washington last Sunday night, the Cardinals have lost three straight, and most importantly, Dallas has not added anyone to the COVID list this week. Head coach Mike McCarthy he likes where his team is at with nearly their full roster still available. This is definitely the position you want to be in because uh, you want the competition during the week. And uh, even with uh, the COVID challenge that we're having, we're, we're, we've been, you know, so far been able to stay above that line. So, uh, and I think it's, it's very, very healthy for you. So, yeah, this is, this is an excellent position to be in. Kickoff on Sunday at AT&T Stadium is set for 3.25 p.m. The Houston Texans are riding their most successful streak of the season. Two straight wins, including a surprising victory over the Char Chargers at home this past weekend. It's definitely a bright spot in what has otherwise been a tough season for first-year head coach David Culley. How does he feel about 2021 now that it's almost in the rearview mirror? There's been some ups and downs, more downs than ups, but it has been everything I thought it would be. Uh, I wish we'd have had a few more wins, but we came here with the process and, and, and we're staying with the process. We're going to stay the course. And I feel like at this point that we, where we are, that the fact that we've stayed the course and that we're following the process, there are things that are starting to, to get better for us. And we're starting to see some uh, positive things happening with the franchise right now and this team. The Texans will face San Francisco this weekend at 3.05 p.m. First game of the college football playoff underway this afternoon. Number one Alabama rolls past Cincinnati, as expected, 27-6. Michigan and Georgia kick off in just a few minutes. We'll have highlights from those two games tonight on the night beat. You get really hyper right before it starts. Got out there and I was like, yeah, this is your last match. You got to pull, you got to bring it and don't let it, don't let it go. All right, let's rewind a bit. Back in April, Steele's Treya Haynes defended her Class 6A 215-pound wrestling title, finishing her career as a two-time state champion. She's one of several incredible sports stories from 2021. And this Sunday night on Instant Replay, we are recapping 12 of the biggest sports headlines from the San Antonio area. And it was really, really difficult to narrow it down to 12. We've got a great list to show you guys, and we hope... We do some justice to what has been a fantastic year for sports in this area. And we need some of that good news, and that'll give us maybe some oomph for just good luck going into 2022. It's the least we can ask for. Yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. We'll be right back after this. Now to the latest on the wildfire disaster in Colorado. We know that more than 500 homes have been destroyed. Tens of thousands of people have been forced to evacuate. Officials are calling this the worst wildfire disaster they have ever seen. ABC's Morgan Norwood has the latest from Los Angeles. God help us. The wildfire catastrophe in Colorado worsening by the hour, Boy. making it the most destructive in state history, triggering hundreds of evacuations across multiple towns and cities. I have people there that need to be evacuated that are unable to do so themselves. The fire seen from above seemingly forming a wall around the city of Lafayette. The skies turning red. Oh my God. On the ground, the winds fueling the out of control flames. ABC's Will Carr in the thick of it. 
We're talking hurricane force winds with gusts up to 115 miles per hour, strong enough to flip trucks and fan the flames. Homes leveled to their foundation, swallowed by fire, and the flames nearly taking over the roads as first responders narrowly escaped. We've actually had you know, deputy sheriffs and, and firefighters in areas that had to pull out because it, it just got overrun. As the firefight continued, the devastation revealed. Where buildings once stood, only concrete, charred wood, and ash remained. So far, it looks like the, the two major hospitals in the areas were spared. Looks like schools were spared. Uh, and uh, we might have our very own New Year's miracle on our hands if it holds up that there was no loss of life. So far, more than 6,000 acres burned and upwards of 500 homes lost. And for this family, decades of memories destroyed. Knowing that the fire is only blocks away and that it really, you really could never see those family photos again, that part was harder than even just seeing the, the devastation. No fatalities have been reported and officials hope the expected three to six inches of snow will help with the firefighting efforts. As for resources, President Joe Biden has already granted an emergency disaster declaration unlocking recovery funds. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. Now another news next Thursday marks one year since the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says that at noon on January 6th, the House is going to hold a prayer and a minute of silence to remember the Capitol insurrection. Lawmakers will then have the opportunity to share their accounts of the attack and another prayer vigil will take place later on on the steps of the Capitol. The Justice Department has charged more than 700 people in connection with that riot, and a House Select Committee is investigating what led up to the attack. I'm sorry to tell you this, but more flight delays could be on the way, and this time because the Federal Aviation Administration has a number of employees who've tested positive for coronavirus. The agency is saying that it might be forced to implement health and cleaning procedures that would reduce the number of flights that it would actually be able to handle. Since Christmas Eve, airlines have canceled more than 11,000 flights. More than 1,000 have already been scrapped for Saturday and Sunday. Mm, yeah, she was a national treasure, really. Actress Betty White passing away today at the age of 99. She was just weeks away from celebrating her 100th birthday. Her career spanning a stunning 80 plus years, and she started when she was just 17. Stephanie Elam has more on the actress's life and career. It's a good day. How can anything go wrong if it's a good day from morning till night? Betty White's cheerful Hollywood career began in her teens, and by her 20s, she was a fixture on television with her own daily talk show. Ahead of the times, White co-founded her own production company in 1952. She worked on a variety of television and film projects over the years before turning a 1973 guest appearance on The Mary Tyler Moore Show into a permanent role. White was a scene stealer as the man-hungry Sue Ann Nivens. I think a man should be virile and macho and just reeking with masculinity. <laughs> Her second signature role was on the beloved series The Golden Girls as the comical Rose Nyland. And they attack chickens. <laughs> I don't care about chickens, Rose. She didn't call me chicken. She called me peacock. You look more like a chicken when you're angry. You're next to something. <laughs> With the Golden Girls, I got to play with those silly ladies every week. So that, and I loved Rose Nyland. She was positive and she was, she wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but she wasn't dumb. She was just terminally naive. Off screen, White married three times. She called her third husband, TV host Alan Ludden, the love of her life. They were together almost 20 years before Ludden died of stomach cancer in 1981. And you never remarried, huh? Nope. When you've had the best, who needs the rest? A devoted pet lover, White was a longtime advocate for animal welfare. She called television her hobby and animals her work. Yet her hobby kept her busy. White's talents as an actress and comedian were in demand well into her senior years. Following a grassroots Facebook campaign in 2010, White became the oldest person ever to host Saturday Night Live at the age of 88. You know what's an accomplishment? Staying awake on the toilet. <laughs> the show earned huge ratings and White her seventh Emmy Award. Later that year, White took on another role on TV Land's Hot in Cleveland. I thought that you weren't coming. 
Well, I ran out of vodka. And I thought I'd come over here and freshen up my drunk. In her 90s, White was as popular as ever with several ongoing film and television projects. How lucky can a 90-year-old broad be? I have no idea. And I'm still working. That's the thing that's such a thrill. Love for her warm smile, wit, and off-color humor, White didn't miss a beat when asked if there were any Hollywood projects she'd still like to do. I usually answer that question with Robert Redford. No, I think I've been lucky enough to do just about so much that I, if I start complaining about anything under the sun, throw me out of the business. Wow, what a life. Now, still ahead, we're just a few hours away from the start of the new year. Find out how the countdown to 2022 is just a little bit different this year. That's up next. We are exactly five hours, 20 minutes away from bringing in the new year, and the landscape is looking so different from last year's celebrations. Allison Ke uh, Kosick, excuse me, is in the heart of Times Square now with the latest. A big, beautiful, newly decorated crystal ball is ready to drop in Times Square. The New Year's celebration is back, but it won't be in full force. But this year is a little different. As the COVID-19 Omicron variant tightens its grip on the nation with record-breaking case numbers, health experts are sounding the alarms. If your plans are to go to a 40 to 50 person New Year's Eve party with all the bells and whistles and everybody hugging and kissing and wishing each other, a happy new year, I would strongly recommend that this year we do not do that. This year's celebration in Times Square has been scaled back with additional safety measures. It's gonna be outdoors, vaccination only, masks required, socially distanced, but we want to show that we're moving forward. And New York isn't the only city scaling back. In Chicago, the fireworks show has been designed to make social distancing easier. And Atlanta canceled its famous peach drop. Despite the setbacks, many people are determined to spend this New Year's together. We've decided that it's worth, worth the risk of doing it. A family in California dropped $1,500 on COVID tests to safely party on. I think we're going to be living like this for a long time, and so getting used to how we do things uh, and limit the risks is important. In Times Square, I'm Allison Kosick. All right, and now we're bringing this back home. A live camera here overlooking 410. A little bit of travel right now on the roadways. Nothing too bad. I'm thinking that just in a few hours, things might get a little bit busier as people get to where they want to be to party for tonight. 77 degrees right now, so it doesn't seem like they'll have to bring a sweater or anything. Now, good weather for maybe popping some confetti. <laughs> oh, yeah. But when isn't it? <laughs> anyway, this evening, nothing to worry about. It's just going to be unseasonably warm and humid. We've had some very chilly. New Year's Eve's in recent history. This is the opposite of that. 78 right now. By 10 o'clock will be 68 degrees and by midnight 67 and then we're really not going to fall much more. We'll be in the mid 60s by early tomorrow morning. The strong cold front arrives around 11 p.m. Saturday. We'll talk about the huge temperature drop, what it means for temperatures and of course winds, dew points, everything and even a hard freeze on the way coming up. All right, so here's something interesting. Pop that cork. Today is not only New Year's Eve, but it's also National Champagne Day. Now, champagne has a shelf life of about three to 10 years. It's really depending on whether it's vintage or non-vintage. So we know that non-vintage has a shorter shelf life. Makes sense. So listen, go ahead, pop the cork and celebrate. 645 right now. We can celebrate because the weather is pretty awesome, at least for all those outdoor New Year's mm -hmm. Eve celebrations. Yeah, and you know, fireworks downtown, nothing to inhibit them. Sometimes we get a low fog and it can get in the way or we get some precipitation and it could get in the way, but not this year. It's actually going to be warm. You can be in your short sleeves and if you want, just wear shorts and flip flops <laughs> outside for gatherings and whatnot. So here are our main headlines. Warm and humid tonight, record warmth again tomorrow. We're expecting to tie another record high temperature. That would be the third day in a row. 50 degree temperature drop within 12 hours. 
That is huge weather whiplash that's headed our way. And just talking about the high temperatures, we'll go from 83 today and tomorrow down to 53 for the warmest temperature all day on Sunday, maybe even a little cooler than that, closer to 50, I think, for a high temperature on Sunday. All right, let's get right to it. Take a look at those readings out there. 78 officially in town, but Stinson on the south side, 82. Meanwhile, Kerrville 69, Divine 77 and Canyon Lake now at 75, along with Bull Verde. Still some 80s farther to the south, Catula 87, Pleasanton 82. Uh, meanwhile, some upper 60s in the hill country. And you look at the bigger picture across our state, there is a little weak frontal boundary. So we're in the 50s up in the panhandle, but that's nothing compared to the cold air that's plunging southward right now. I mean, we're talking 20s, teens and even below zero readings across the Northland with this next cold front that's headed our way. Currently, the cold front is basically crossing from Kansas into Oklahoma right now, and it's a sharp temperature drop along that front. So let's just talk about temperatures and take you through time. 7 a.m. tomorrow, west of I-35 near 60. So unseasonably warm, locally will be in the mid 60s and even near 70 along the Gulf Coast. Then by the afternoon, we do this all over again, well into the 80s and even 91 degrees for the high temperature in Catula. Up in the hill country will be in the upper 70s. Bottom line, another very spring-like day. Here's when the big temperature drop happens. Between 5 p.m. Saturday and 5 a.m. Sunday, we'll drop about 50 degrees, 83 down to 32 in that time frame. So a sharp and noticeable temperature drop with that cold front when it hits tomorrow night, and you'll really feel it by Sunday morning. Monday morning, we're talking temperatures in the mid 20s, so a hard freeze likely for a good portion of our area on Monday morning. Winds are another headline here. It's going to become gusty. Not all that bad out there right now, about five to 15 miles per hour. Tomorrow at noon, that's when the dry line hits. That's going to make, make its way through our area by about 11 a.m. or noon. Wind gusts, 20, 25 miles per hour. The cold front hits tomorrow night, and winds will be gusting to about 40 to 45 miles per hour for Saturday night through a good portion of Sunday. That's also going to get rid of all the mugginess. So we'll start the day with a bit of humidity in the air tomorrow, but that's going to be swept away by the noon hour. And then you're not even going to think of humidity. You're not even going to notice it for the foreseeable future. Actually, another cold front's likely to hit us on Thursday, giving us another well, similar temperature drop. All right, here's the big picture. The much needed moisture, it's in West Texas. It's in North Texas. At least somebody's getting in on the activity. We could all use it. At least somebody's getting some. Upper level system is basically centered right over Tucson, Arizona. That's going to stay to the north of us and all that rainfall and moisture is going to stay north of us as well. So a dry frontal passage here. Nothing but sunshine tomorrow. 83 the high west wind at 10 to 20. Sunday we start at the freezing point. Our first official freeze likely Sunday morning. Then only 53 for the high Sunday afternoon. And it may even be a few degrees cooler than that. Wouldn't shock me if we only get to 50 degrees. And then Monday, mid 50s, we get to the 60s and 70s briefly Tuesday and Wednesday. Then the next strong cold front hits on Thursday. All right, Adam, thank you. Now, in case you missed it, it is coming up next. And good morning to you. It is Friday, December 31st. Authorities say the driver of the 2004 Mustang was driving on the access road near Southwest Loop 410 when it hit a puddle of water in the road and lost control. The car slammed into a utility pole, a tree, a fire hydrant, and metal railing before coming to its stop on the roof. A super spreader can happen in your living room if you don't take the, your own precautions. That's what we're emphasizing now is that people have to use the tools that we have available to us to end the spread and to get us through this. Yeah, the mayor joined Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf and University Health this morning, urging the public to at least wear their masks in addition to being vaccinated and try to avoid large clusters of people. An argument over dogs is apparently what led to a man's death. The victim in this case is Valentin Gonzalez IV, and the alleged shooter is 18-year-old Jordan Eaton. Gonzalez's wife told investigators that Eaton approached her and her husband at the apartment complex on Wurzbach Road about the way that they treated treat their dogs. She says they started arguing and that Eaton pulled out his gun and fired towards her. There was some sort of a struggle between the two men and that's when she says that her husband was shot in the stomach and now Eaton is facing murder and aggravated assault charges.
Now, sad news today for Betty White fans. The longtime comedic actress has died at the age of 99. The five-time Emmy Award winner had a really long career in Hollywood with roles in the Mary Tyler Moore show, and she would have celebrated her 100th birthday on January 17th. <laughs>